It's unfortunate how often discussions of history become contentious. People come to the table defensive, reacting from an emotional place, and that makes sense because it's important. But something is lost when history is used as a cudgel and we lose the ability to connect to it. Our guest today is striving to talk about big historical ideas and connect them with the intimately personal. He's telling a human story that connects us all. Hope you enjoy our conversation with Jermaine Fowler, the host of the Humanity Archive podcast and author of the Humanity Archive, Reclaiming the Soul of Black History from a Whitewashed American Myth, which is now a New York Times bestseller. This is Too Complicated for History. So sometimes I start these shows by saying I am the self-conscious non-PhD in the room. But today, we are joined by someone else who does not have an advanced degree. You would think that'd make me feel better. However, this person who also doesn't have a PhD happens to be a recent New York Times bestselling author. So I still maintain my self-consciousness in this conversation. Uh, We are welcoming to the show today Jermaine Fowler, creator of the Humanity Archive podcast and now author of the Humanity Archive, Recovering the Soul of Black History from a Whitewashed American Myth, which is, as I said before, a New York Times bestseller. Uh, Thank you so much for being here, Jermaine. Oh, thank you all for inviting me. Uh, I love having conversations like this. So I'm excited to dive into some history today. Thank you. Yeah, we're super excited to have you. I pre-ordered your book, so I was very excited when it came out and super excited that to have you on our show. And I like your story about how you ended up with the Humanity Archive, even before the book. So can you just give us a little bit of background about how you got to the point of creating the Humanity Archive, your podcast, and then that how that ended up into a New York Times bestselling book? Yeah, it's it's been a, a winding and a, and a twisting journey in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, my interest in history started as a kid in the library. You know, I was in school uh, and it was Black History Month and I didn't see a lot of uh, broad range of representation of, of Black historical figures. You know, you had the kind of Mount Rushmore of, uh, you know, Black historical figures in my history book. And I remember that we uh, read a story about Rosa Parks and I was like, there's got to be more of this story. I've always been intellectually curious and, uh, you know, I call myself an intellectual adventurer. So I didn't live very far from the library. So I rode uh, my bike there and went in and I asked the librarian, you know, where's the black history section? And I just lost myself within those shelves. And, you know, once I felt like I was uh, I had a comprehensive view of my own history. Then I kind of went to some other history and started studying the history of humanity. So, um, you know, those journeys back and forth to the library year after year, you know, studying the humanities started the Humanity Archive before I even knew uh, that the Humanity Archive was going to be a thing, you know, when I was 13 years old. So, um, you know, it all starts there. And uh, fortunately for me and, and uh, what brought it all home is when I went on my book tour, the first place I went was the same library that I, uh, you know, kind of had that discovery as a kid. So that was a, a beautiful moment. But the Humanity Archive, it's uh, it ranges from a podcast to, uh, you know, my Instagram account where I share history to my book that has come out uh, recently that you picked up um, and just a whole range of courses and, you know, just trying to build my own archive uh, with the history that I wanted to see as that kid in the library growing up. And just a side note, I love that you talked about using the card catalog because I, I've used a card catalog too. And I think a lot of younger folks have no idea. Yeah, it's, <laughs> what it's one of those like. uh, generational jokes, I think, you know, <laughs> I flew over some, some younger people's heads, right? But yes, they can do those. <laughs> Manila cards to find a book definitely was a little more uh, difficult than it is now. You just get on the computer and go find it. But absolutely <laughs> yeah but you know occasionally like you said we, we were discovering in that library you know it, it led to accidental discoveries you know you're thumbing through the cards and you would see something that you didn't expect versus being able to go like beeline directly to what you were looking for um so that's, something I, that's nice what i it. love about the study of history myself i don't know about you all is the discovery aspect of it yes. I, I tell a lot of people i, I don't 
a lot of the things that I'm finding out, I just found out a week ago or even yesterday sometimes, right? But knowledge to me is not about what you know, it's about your willingness to discover, your willingness to be curious and go out and seek more information and, and take those investigations and see where the, the history leads you or the story leads you. And then, you know, coming back and then uh, sharing your interpretation of that. So discovery is the it's my, one of my favorite things about the study of history. Yeah, we love that. And that's sort of why we call our you know, show too complicated for history because we want the untold stories, the unknown stories. I think we've both learned a lot throughout our episodes. Um, But talking about how you got to where you were, I like how you talked about sort of your progression and how you studied history. So you started out in school and you got the sort of Eurocentric view Mm -hmm. of history from school, which, you know, I think we've all had. I certainly, that's the kind of history it's I got standard. in school. Like that's the sort of, the, yeah, that's what the you standard, got. Yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's, it's, it's the what people call history. You know, I was using air quotes. Um, and then you went to the Afrocentrism. You know, you said, forget that. I'm going to study this. But then you actually saw some issues in focusing on, you know, Afrocentrism as well. And you kind of came to this, this decision of, uh, I like to a history of humanity. So can you sort of talk about that that transition with your studies? Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was kind of black and white, right? So you have Eurocentrism on one end that centers mm-hmm. Europe in, in historical studies. Uh, you know, Europe is the center of the historical universe and everything kind of branches out from that. So, um, you know, and even in the book, I talk about how, um, you know, even even with this Eurocentric view, you might have a... Uh, um, Toussaint L'Ouverture, you know, he's mm-hmm. called the Black Napoleon, right? So it's always that right. reference point of, of Euro, European figures. Uh, and there, there's countless examples like that. Uh, Granville uh, Woods, the Black Thomas Edison, et cetera. So, you know, to uh, grow up with that and, you know, that can kind of have, I can, you can internalize that as a Black person um, and begin to think, well, wow, like what else is there and what did, you know, Black people create, right? So sure. that's kind of where my mind was, you know, growing up. Uh, you know, when I started to discover this black history, you know, I kind of went on the other end of the spectrum, like, hey, if uh, Eurocentrism, you know, it's got this, uh, it's very much like, especially, you know, some of the older histories, uh, and even some now, you know, the black history they ignored, or, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, up until the 60s and 70s, it was just straight, you know, black people are inferior kind of vibes to the history. And they even said that even further down the line, but, um, you know, you can internalize that. So, Afrocentrism then centered in Africa in history, you know, all things African, uh, uplifting Africa, the contributions and the uh, African civilizations and, and everything that comes along with that. Um, but the worst of Afrocentrism, though, is kind of on just another the flip of the coin of the worst of Eurocentrism, because it can get kind of kind of ugly in the debates of, you know, for instance, whether the ancient Egyptians are black or white or, um, you know, right. applying race to a time where it didn't exist or kind of uh, denigrating all things European. So I came around, uh, you know, full circle to this idea that, um, you know, I really want to focus always on humanity as the underlying theme to where I can still talk about the raw realities of race or gender or anything else, but still like what ties it all together? Like, what can we come back to as a rallying point? And for me, that became humanity. So, uh, you know, I'm still able to talk about, you know, Black issues and race and all these things, Mm -hmm. but kind of all tie it back to this kind of connecting tissue of uh, humanity that, that brings us all together. It's, it's really fascinating how you talk about your journey from being able to sort of self-identify with the history that you're reading. Um, just talking personally, because um, I'm, I'm mixed, I'm half white and half Indian. So, mm-hmm. I, and, and I never quite, it's, it's an interesting space to be in because you're never quite part of either group entirely. Yeah. And there really isn't anyone in history for me to directly identify with. So your current approach to, um, you know, sort of looking things at a broad spectrum is one that I really uh, personally find fulfilling, um, like listening to your listening to your work um, and reading what you, your, your thoughts on it, um, because it allows someone like me to actually like, hey, yeah, I am part of this, despite the fact that there is no one that's exactly like me, you know, Absolutely. walking through this time. Yeah, that, uh, we are all connected in, in, in this sense. There's no reason to divide it up and subdivide things further um, in, in our exploration and learning. Yeah, because what you find, I mean, in the study of history, at least the way that I study, you know, I have a certain framework and uh, that I, I study history from. And it's always like this humanity ethic. And, and you begin to realize that no civilization, no group of people has a monopoly on civilization, on uh, great thoughts or ideas or 
on the other side of the coin on, uh, you know, a human atrocity and violence and war, you know, that that's shot through each and every culture. Right. And, um, right. you know, we, we can't hide from that. We can't ignore that. So ultimately, you know, if we hide from that, we're only hiding from ourselves because all those things are human at the end of the day. So again, in, in that way, then I can, you know, jump over to Africa and learn some profound knowledge and I can jump over to Europe and learn some profound knowledge. And then, you know, looking, because if you don't do that, if you uh, only focus on the bad, which I, I, I see a lot of people tend to do now. Well, you're kind of discarding the good now. It's kind of like treating, uh, you know, cancer with chemotherapy. You're just destroying all the healthy cells and and mm-hmm. the cancer cells at the same time. Well, you know, Europe has done some terrible things, right? And, you know, have, the, have this whole system that's been set up. But at the end of the day, you know, there's some great thinkers and some great philosophies that we can. I mean, you know, there's all these good things as well. So cut away the bad, keep the good. That's kind of my approach to it. Uh, and then coming back again to that theme of humanity, just always with everything. So Yeah, your approach feels additive, meaning that you're adding to the collective knowledge with these personal stories and connecting with people versus um, I need to remove something from the canon in order to put something else in. It seems it feels like you're, right. you know, putting additional valuable information into into the sphere of, uh, of public knowledge. Yeah, I think yeah, it's uh, for me. It's about you know how do, how do we bring it bring it all together? Because I think again, I think there's this separation, as you said, about your identity. Because identity is very much tied to history. It's kind of why I dedicated yes. a chapter to that. Uh, it's titled "Who Are You?" Yeah. Right? Because you know, ultimately, history is stories. It's our ancestors. We're all connected to it. That's why it's so powerful. That's why you know every nation throughout history has tried to control the historical narrative. Uh, America is not unique in that. I mean, we see efforts to do that now in America. You know, uh, with what history's taught, how it's taught, where it's taught, you know, uh, what's cut out, what's left in. But this has been going on since, uh, you know, ancient Rome. You know, they used to uh, deface statues of, uh, you know, the, the emperors that they didn't like, you know, if they wanted to just erase them from the history books. Um, you know, so this has been going on. So it's um, for me, it's about not about controlling and it's just more about how can we connect the narrative versus control the narrative of, you know, of, of everyone so that we can all see ourselves in history, as you said, that um, you think you you could do this approach. So that's that's very validating for me to hear that from you. And, uh, you know, that's my goal at the end of the day. I, I love that it's just you're talking about what brings us together and how we're alike instead of talking about differences, which I think we that's just what we focus on. So why not focus on how we're alike as well? And I mean, you talk a little bit about this in your book, and it's something that I've always struggled with that. American history is the history of everyone, of all of us. And yet we still have these special months like Women's History Month, Black History Month. And I think they're necessary because we don't, we, they're not incorporated as much as they should be yet in our national narrative. But then at the same time, I feel awkward about sort of pulling out groups like women and African-Americans and saying, well, they get their own month because they're not part of the other 11 months. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and you talk a little bit about that in your book, but I'm just wondering, um, where do you think we're going with that? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one, right? Because, uh, you know, I, I do talk about how Black history, Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Black history, he did not want Black history to last this long. He wanted it to end because he said right. we should study not uh, Black history, we should study Black people in history. And there's that sub, uh, subtle distinction to say that ultimately it shouldn't be separated, right? We should just study Black people equally with everyone else. And then there wouldn't be a need for Black history because we would just be studying, you know, Black history alongside. So, you know, if you talk about George Washington and, uh, you know, the Revolutionary War, right, you're going to mention that 15 to 25 percent of his uh, army was Black. You know, it's going to be part mm-hmm. of the narrative, right? But you kind of have this... Um, idea of this totally white revolution without any other contributions or anything. I think I saw, uh, you know, they have the craft beer now and uh, there's like this beer. It said like the spirit of 1776. And they got that picture of like the white guys playing the flute and drink, you know, so it's like looked at as this kind right. of only white revolution. Slavery is not a lot of times brought into it. And, um, you know, this kind of patriotic narrative is not telling the whole story. So, you know, Woodson is just saying, hey, Let's make sure that we're telling the full story and including everybody in in the national narrative. Um, but unfortunately, I, I don't think that that's I don't want to be pessimistic. Glass half empty, but I don't think that's going to happen because history shows us that the narrative is, you know, typically always going to be controlled. So the corrective that I tried to teach is, OK, 
study all the history. I wish we would teach students like that, right? Just give them a bunch of different history books from all genres and, uh, you know, economic history, patriotic history, uh, Marxist, whatever. I don't, it doesn't matter, right? All of it. You know, I've got right. a patriotic, I've got, that's what my bookshelf looks like. I have books I don't agree with on my bookshelf. Um, and then looking at all these, looking at all these different perspectives and then bring it together so that we can formulate our own opinions. And uh, history is always, you know, they're always trying to teach it from one book. You, you just can't, you know, and um, I think that's why, you know, it's a failed approach. And uh, that's, why Black History Month, you know, it does need to be incorporated. I'm just not sure if it mm-hmm. will be because we still need it because it's not incorporated into, you know, the single story narrative that America likes to tell itself. At least not enough anywhere in a, in a real substantial way. Absolutely. So uh, in another part of our lives, Lynn and I work on documentaries. That's a, that's sort of what our, what, our, uh, what else our company does, um, aside from this podcast. And um, there is a little bit of overlap in sort of the way we decided to approach tackling history and sort of wanting it to be very personal. I've really connected with the way in the Humanity Archive, the podcast specifically, um, uh, was talked basically focused on individuals and told individual stories and really, really tried to bring people to life. Um, could you, why, what brought you to, to that conclusion that this was hey, an effective way to convey this information? Um, Cause it definitely is. I mean, I, I, I mentioned to my wife that Rosa Parks did yoga and she was like, what? And like <laughs> my wife does yoga. Right. And so like, like now all of a sudden she has like a personal connection with Rosa Parks. So there's, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, that's that's really um, the empathy part of it. And I think that's the power of the story um, to to create empathy, to tell the details of someone's life, to tell details of what they experienced. Uh, for instance, I did an episode on 9-11 and, um, mm-hmm. you know, I could have went all kinds of directions with mm-hmm. that. You know, there's the the political side of it that people like to hammer on and talk about. There's the... Uh, there's just so many different angles to it, right? The conspiracy sides that you hear, and you know, just all these different things that I see focused on from uh, documentaries to YouTube to social media. But for me, and just bringing this humanity ethic to it, I just kind of shift all that to the side and say, who was there? Who lived through it? What did they experience? What was that like for them? The human side of it, right? So then you learn these very harrowing mm-hmm. stories of people who, uh, you know, tried to stop the hijackers on one of the planes and they were calling their family members uh, as they knew they were about to, to die, right? And uh, that, that really hits you right in the heart. Um, you know, stories of brave firefighters running in, you know, where they've told their stories and they've told their accounts. So to say it in their words and hear it in their words just really brings an emotional aspect to it to it that I think, again, ties back to we are more connected than, uh, you know, the media a lot of times uh, likes to tell us that we aren't, you know, the, you know, we see that here in these smaller conversations. When we talk to people on the street, you know, it's not as disconnected as, uh, you know, a lot of people try to tell us that it is. So I think for me, telling those stories in that way is just part of my goal to bring people together again uh, so that you can relate to them and see yourself in them. Yeah, we well, were it actually, certainly seems like what you're doing ahead. is working. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Isaac, it's just yeah. I put that in there that you, people are really responding, which to me is a very positive sign. Yeah, it's been hard, too, because, you know, it's easy. I mean, you know, it's uh, controversy sells. Right. So I could just jump on and talk about, you know, the, all this divisive stuff. And right. uh, I, I know I'd probably have even more of a following and uh, be further along. But, you know, and it's sometimes it's kind of lonely to take this approach, honestly, because there is so much uh, of the opposite out there. Um, but, you know, this is what I've chosen. And this is what speaks to me. And I'm, I'm glad to be on this path to uh, you know try to bring this uh unique perspective, I would say, you know, to, to history and, uh, allow people to connect through it. Yeah. It's actually weirdly enough. I think today the trailer for a, not to date this uh, episode specifically, but today the trailer for a docu-series on Netflix came out, uh, I think this morning, um, about Africa. Um, I think, I don't know whether it's a series of Af- African, um, rulers or Queens, but, um, I know the one that was getting some attention online was about, um, uh, Cleopatra specifically and mm. it's planting its flag in sort of like the an afrocentric view of cleopatra was black which is yeah. a a difficult a weird a very historically complicated thing to talk about when you're talking about the ptolemaic the pharaoh of of egypt um yeah but it's specifically it's it sells right it i mean it got people exactly tw- it got exactly. people tweeting it's about true. this right so like now mm-hmm. all of a sudden this netflix show who's really going to watch this history documentary is getting people riled up 
on one side or the other. So they're going to check it out. Um, exactly. So, yeah, the good history, the complicated history is harder to do. <laughs> uh, right. Um, like and you another said, thing in, in your book that, that jumped out at me because I've worked in uh, museum environments or actually I've worked at historic sites. Um, and you ask if we're we're really naive to think that these these sites are are willing to sort of give up the the narrative that makes money <laughs> to try to, um, you know, tell tell a more accurate and a more thorough narrative. But at the same time, that could could hurt their bottom line, I guess exactly. I would say. Um, so it's like this being naive, but being hopeful. And are we just being, you know, too hopeful that businesses are willing to lose money, essentially? I mean, I think it's still necessary for, for the pushes. I mean, you know, you all have, oh, we yeah. have all platforms too, but I mean, as far as like the, the big money uh, in terms of like, you know, the larger museum networks, I mean, so, you know, for instance, here there's, there's two museums, there's this Black History Museum, and then there's the, uh, you know, there's one that's more of the commercial museum and, you know, I mean, it just is what it is, right? They're going to tell some of the story and they get more funded. And then the Black History Museum is kind of like off a little more obscure. I mean, and, um, so, you know, people are trying to start their own organizations, but I think the, you know, people make money in the way where they uh, know what people are coming for. They know what they're looking for. They might want a little bit of the uh, the real story, but, you know, ultimately they're coming for a specific thing. Um, you know, whether it be South Carolina, I talked about like Robert Smalls and, uh, you know, but in South Carolina, people are mostly coming for the nostalgia, for the the old homes and for the, uh, you know, a certain kind of brand of African American experience, um, you know, or if you flip, you know, and that's more kind of, I would say a sanitized version, you know, where you talk about a little bit, but not really dive deeply into it. Or on the flip side of that, as you mentioned, Netflix, they, so, you know, that's one end, the more kind of softer end of the history, but then on the other end, Netflix goes to the other end is like, we're just going to go straight forward. Right. And just say, you know, we're going to, we're going to go to that, denominator of people who uh, believe this way. And, uh, you know, but I think the more nuanced history is what I, I try to tell, you know, where you're willing to get complicated and, you know, dive into all these different perspectives and just kind of work your way out of them. And again, that's why I say, you know, uh, you know, maybe I could be a little further along if I took one or the other approach, but, uh, you know, just have the integrity to tell these nuanced stories, uh, you know, and uh, to see what happens. So, yeah, further along is a relative <laughs> a benchmark exactly like, yeah because yeah, i mean you're pushing against the the grain but mm -hmm. that's needed that's the thing i mean that's what we're trying to do i mean that's that was our point is that there's all these you know people who are just ignored or erased or forgotten about and you know you were doing exactly what we wanted to do and so you know to me that's something that more of that is needed so it's good that you're going against Actually, the grain. Actually, there is a subtle distinction between some of the work that we do, Lynn, and, and some of the work that Jermaine is doing in that. Um, so at least the documentaries that we're, we're working on are explicitly deal with the American founding, right? And, yeah. and, and, and the figures of like Washington and, and Adams and things like that. And part of the goal was to humanize, but it was interesting in our case, it was the goal was to humanize in order to break down a mythology, basically like to destroy the group, like the, the, the right. deification of this, of someone who has been focused on, but in the wrong way versus, mm -hmm. you know, some of the other stories that you're covering where someone who hasn't been focused on at all, right. That needs to be added right. to the canon. Um, that but it's interesting that it's the same method it was like, Hey, I want to talk about what this guy was like at dinner with his kids, right? Like that's how, like I want to, and you, and you accomplish two different things by, by using the same thing. Like you were saying, empathy, uh, by, by rehumanizing yeah. that human George being. Washington, I think he got, at the end of his life, did he get his blood drained or they had died like a horrible <laughs> death or something? Uh, they, oh, yeah. they, exactly tortured talking, but, yeah. <laughs> they, they tortured that poor dude. They tortured that guy. Some of the um, aspects to his life uh, that would be like, wow, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> and like, he didn't even want to be president either. I mean, so that's, I kind of like kind of touch on that in my book too, to where like, um, you know, he has this one side, this dark side, but he also has these other qualities that were admirable. So how do you reconcile that? Right. But then the national narrative is when you go to the Capitol Rotunda and you look up and there's the apotheosis of Washington into heaven. Yeah. Up to the status of a God, you know, so I mean, <laughs> you have that and then you have, uh, you know, and I, I guess where the work is similar from what it sounds to me is, you know, we're all trying to just dive into the more complicated aspects and, um, you know, just acknowledge the, the good, the bad, and just see what the takeaways are from all of it. 
you know, instead of just latching on to, to one uh, or the other, which is from pretty a, much what, what you see for the most part in the way history is presented. From a personal perspective, do you ever, because I used to get pretty frustrated reading about Washington, because I'd read, like you said, it's like like lots of different dichotomies and lots of contradictions. And I'd read some stuff about him and be like, this is the greatest dude that's ever lived. And then I'd flip the page mm-hmm. and read another another letter and be like, and throw the book against the ground and be like, God, <laughs> Yeah. Damn it, can you please be better? <laughs> like I wanted him to be better. Uh, uh, do you ever do you ever find yourself basically trying, like disappointed? I guess in the people that you're reading, you're like, oh, you're so close, or like, oh, this is really like I, I don't know why I feel um, like from a personal perspective, like I want them to be the people that I want them to be, mm-hmm. and they regularly disappoint me. Um, but I don't, I don't, I maybe I'm just getting a little we too hold emotionally these figures involved. in such high regard, right? Um, I think it's uh-huh. because you know they are held in such high regard. So uh, you know, it's you know once they're they're lifted up so high, you know, there's a little bit of a letdown whenever you find out these these other qualities they had that were sometimes uh, horrible, you know, uh, from beliefs that were sometimes horrible. And even if you know from a historical mindset, even if you try to um, you know, you I could sprinkle in even a little bit of like you know the time that people lived in and. Maybe if they're on a point system, you know, give them a couple points back for that. But, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, even with that, though, I see people, um, you know, people within that time period who still acted differently, though, and went against the grain even then. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, but th- but there's a lot of these people who are lifted up so high, though, it's kind of hard to um, hard to take whenever you uh, see that they were flawed individuals. Right. And that that's not just uh, George Washington either. I mean, uh you look at Marcus Garvey, some people say he was like a huckster and a scam artist. I mean, uh, James Baldwin, great writer, but, you know, he had his vices. I mean, he like died of cancer from smoking too many cigarettes. I mean, I talk about that in the book, too, right? It's all flawed. Mm-hmm. Human being, you're going to find a flaw if you look for it. So it's best not to, to lift people so high because you're always going to be let down if you lift them up to the status of a demigod when you find out they're human, <laughs> too. Yeah, like Gandhi <laughs> yeah. was a bad husband and a bad dad. Like, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. So, yeah, like, some, some right. terrible things I read about Gandhi uh, to make yeah. me like, oh, do I want to use this guy's quotes right now? And like, on my video, so right. it's like, again, how right. do you reconcile like, that? Now, right. right. And I get flack for some of the quotes. I, I'll post a quote or something like, did you know this guy did this or he did that? So there's always going to be that, too. <laughs> right. It's un- it's unfortunate that, that, you know, that they were people. It would be great if they yeah. weren't people. Right. <laughs> and that's where like, I go they would, back to, make it you know, easier. Yeah. try to... Try to take the good, you know, uh, talk. I mean, I'm more than to talk about the bad, you know, for sure all day. But that doesn't make these words that he said terrible either. You know, there's kind of, you know, right. right. What word is it in too? Like, I'm not going to like, where, where do you draw the line? I guess, too, is, is an interesting mm-hmm. question. Like, I'm not going to it doesn't matter if Hitler uh, wrote the greatest poetry on Earth. Like, I'm not going to quote him. Right. So, like, where do you draw <laughs> right. that line in between? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, how bad were they before you kind of take still take the good from from that person so that's that's an interesting question too it also makes it a lot easier to relate to people in the past because i think a lot of us have done stupid things and or made mistakes and we think well gosh am i a bad person or you know but you can step back and say i can still do great things Mm -hmm. you know this person screwed up too or this person made a dumb decision too and so it's it's nice to sort of see that these people who are flawed can achieve great things because it means maybe we can too, you know. I think another and it, question it, it, I ask too is, um, and this is a hard one for people because it, it really, for me, of history is also about reflection of my own mm-hmm. uh, humanity. So if I was to put myself in in any of these people's shoes, you know, uh, what would I have done, right? Um, like I don't, I mean, there's several examples of this. There's that, uh, and I've said something about Hitler, but there's that um, guy. I don't know if you've seen that photo where everybody else is. Uh, like throwing up the how Hitler. And then there's one guy who's just standing like that. Right. But yeah. if you were there, you probably would have been throwing that up too, because people conform, they comply. A lot of people will say like during slavery, I would have rebelled with Nat Turner. Well, unfortunately, most people didn't. This is the way things were. And they mostly comply. They're always trying to take care of their families and, you know, it's not uh, fair to the people who lived and, through that to live to hold the standard. Yeah, 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 it's not I, fair. I think so yeah, it's dinner. Yeah, it's definitely not fair. Right. Um, and you know, they resisted in their own ways, but most people weren't just rebellion. Most, I mean, the most, way people tried to rebel is just by running away if they could, but most people weren't just rising up, right? And 
Or like having a relationship or like, you know, hey, like, like, or, or cultivating a hobby, right? Like those yeah. were small ways to have a life and maintain your right? humanity yeah. that shouldn't be disregarded because they weren't like, you know, picking up a gun exactly. and shooting people, right? And there's people uh, now who, who want certain things to happen and change it to, to happen, but they're not doing any of those things now either. That, right. You know, uh, they're, they're no, you're no different than, than them, right? I mean, again, so, uh, you know, there, there's all these different aspects, I think, that are interesting to explore from a a place of more complexity and nuance than, uh, you know, just this kind of black and white approach to history. Um, this or that, you know, there's this, the truth is always found somewhere in that middle. That's where you kind of dive into that mess of everything and then come up with profound truths and ideas and thoughts. And, uh, I just think most people are just, it's easier to, to, to go this way or that way, follow, follow everybody else. So, uh, we're taking a, uh, not so well beaten path. So sorry for the interruption, but we're going to take a brief break now for a word from our sponsors. Right. But to believe you'd be the hero. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Like to believe and want to think you were the hero, but no. Yeah. You know. Everyone's yeah. the protagonist. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, they, they, I think our listeners have heard, heard this before, but I think that that's where the, actually the, the title of the show comes from a conversation that I had. Um, um, and I was talking to, to a historian about um, Aung San Suu Kyi, who is the, the um, president of Myanmar, because... Uh, she, you know, has the Nobel Peace Prize, was like the next mm-hmm. Nelson Mandela, this, that, and the other. And then all of a sudden, she's a genocide apologist. And I was like, only mm-hmm. one of those gets to survive in the history textbooks, right? Yeah. Like, they don't, not, but they're not going to have a, a chapter on one and then a chapter on the other stuff. Oh, yeah. It's going to be one version of her yeah, that lives. Yeah, yeah. She's too complicated a, for history, right? And like it depends on who's <laughs> in power at the time, exactly. right? Of which narrative is going to be. That, there, yeah. There's an interesting point I can't, uh, was brought up about. Um, Genghis Khan and, um, you know, how, how far in the passage of time, too, does it take for someone's atrocities to just kind of fall away, right? Because, you know, right. Genghis Khan's got this giant statue and people look at him as like, you know, this great conqueror, which, but you don't really think about the details that go underneath that kind of grand word of conqueror, right? This great guy who almost just took over the world, right? And, you know, uh, half the world's got Genghis Khan DNA, you know, he's just this guy who's just larger than life figure, but like they used to like eat dinner on bodies, you know, and like that side of him too, yeah. where like, you know, is Hitler in a thousand years going to be looked at as some guy who, I, you know, like how long does right. it take before uh, all that falls away? And then you're only looking at these very cursory aspects of this person's life versus like all, all the brutality of the, the Genghis Khan empire and, uh, you know, just the, the horrible things that they did to people. Yeah. Right? If um, it came to like a murder machine, like Genghis Khan was one of the greatest to ever do it. Like he was like very, very yeah. efficient at killing people and they're really good at figuring out how to do it, um, in the most brutal fashion possible. But yeah, like time does like the distance in, in time makes, makes that weird. I think I forget. It might've been one of Dan Carlin's podcasts or something like that. Hardcore history where he brings up that yeah. a similar, a similar point to what you were making was that, you know, um, that he, like people look at Genghis Khan and, and are able to say like, oh, well the, the, you know, the Mongols brought all of this technology from China into Europe or this or connected the Middle East to China and basically established the beginning of the Silk Road. And he's like, yeah, but you're ignoring all the dead people that, ha- that happened mm-hmm. to that. Yeah. And yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's always, it's again, this goes back to the, to the black and white, right. Uh, you know, if, and, you know, there's been arguments made within history circles, too, of like, OK, Europe brought all this, uh, quote unquote, technology, you know, and all these things to around the world. And, you know, colonialism was good. I think there was an article that came out, um, I don't know, however many years ago, a few years. It hasn't been that long. And, uh, you know, people railed against it because this uh, historian was arguing that colonialism was good for the world. Um, you know, so they, they didn't even there's let the argument people that make that accept- argument in certain yeah. circles yeah, today. Yeah, down immediately. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's it's what perspective you you want to take. Right. And, um, you know, and I think people are fighting for their perspective to be the dominant one, as opposed, again, to uh, allowing, you know, all these different perspectives to kind of come together democratically to where we can decide for ourselves between which one we believe is just more people that are trying to persuade and uh, very strongly that you should believe the same thing they do. And one thing that actually Isaac brought up that has made me think a lot is that before photography, it's harder for us to 
relate or to see them. What did you say? It was like, it may as well be I the said Game it might of as well be Lord of the Rings. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like there's a certain point at which it right. becomes fantasy, right? In people's minds where the, like, the, you know, the, uh, it, it isn't, Rome isn't real. It exists in the same part right. of my brain as like Lord of the Rings because I don't see the people in it. I can't empathize in the same way. Uh, you know? And I think that starts somewhere before photography. Like as soon as yeah. we can start yeah. seeing people's faces, um, that it, and the farther you go back, the worse it gets. Uh, yeah, that, and that's that, probably like, why is kind of, you know because you don't you don't know who the people who died under under his hands, right? You only see this like he right. don't. The only him and his empire is what's what's left over from that, not the victims, right? History written by the victors. We don't have accounts, which I wonder, too, if I mean, will that change, you know, in our generation now? Like you said, you have photography and then a lot changed with the printing press, of course, people who read stories about these things and write stories about these things. So the power that's why they say uh, executions ended, I think, is because the printing press had a lot to do with that because people could read like, oh, man, like this is. You know, in the detail and all that of how horrible right. these yeah, or things are. Seeing a video so, of something is very different than you know. Yeah, it can, and it doesn't. It's not all the hype of the crowd. You know, people used to go to these things, but you know, there's all this energy there. But if you're just re- sitting with it and reading about it and thinking about it, like it's a totally different experience. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting. You know, to go to the future and kind of see, you know, how we'll be empathized with with video and uh, you know, right. Areas, uh, People, it'll be much easier to study history, you know, a hundred years from now, even based on all the the things people have to to pour through and study over, you know, of what's happening yeah. now. We should, you'd hope. Um, I think I, there has to be some difference. Social I think, media to be able to, like, is going to be someone's a mess face, for right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. That, I mean, <laughs> because it's like curated. I mean, to I mean, I don't envy future historians um, <laughs> because I think so much online is so self curated. Not that letters weren't. Um, you know, from the 18th century. But once you get down into the non-elites, you start seeing genuineness. And I think that's going to be the issue with the the future is that mm. <laughs> there's so little genuineness on online. Yeah. Um, at least in my opinion. <laughs> that'll be a whole study within itself, right? Because yeah. a lot of it yeah. is, uh, you know, that's why I like podcasts a lot because it's more genuine feel, you know, the conversation, yeah. or, you know, even, you know, even some of the stuff I put online, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, thinking it over more so than, than, you know, it's like, it's, uh, it's put together, I guess I would say, you know, you got to get video clips and you just put together, it's produced, right. right. Versus, um, you know, just the, the natural flow of thought like here, or, you know, if I journaled, as you said, or wrote a letter, you know, it's, it's not that for sure. So like, where do you, you know, what's real, what's not, what's put on, right. what's not. So I think that will be difficult to, uh, determine what were the real thoughts of people. Yeah, I can't even comprehend what it would be like to try to like parse through like what a Twitter, because given how quickly things change and like what's like the mm, hot topic yeah. of the moment, like it's going to yeah. f- seem schizophrenic, like just all over the place in a given year, <laughs> like things vacillating wildly between various subjects and topics. Um, man, yeah, I, I hadn't even actually thought about that. <laughs> but that's, that, yeah, that's, that's going to be, be fun. That's interesting thought to, to, to think because, uh, you know, it's... Now, okay, what do we do? We go to we go to books, we go to primary sources, mostly written. You know, you might have some video footage you can look at. Um, you know, it's much easier now. We don't have yeah again. So, uh, well, yeah, we'll say a hundred years because usually people don't really touch history from like the nineteen seventies. You know, you got to you go back a little further because it gets a little too uh, it's too recent. I think so. Right. People were around. Like, I'm talking about somebody, that in my book too, like. Yeah. Uh, most people don't go beyond the 70, you know, you wait, it's about maybe a 50 year mark or at least that, you know, before right. history, sure. you know, but, uh, yeah. So a hundred, yeah. What will history be written? Like, you know, in the future, I, I, I think that's just, uh, interesting thought for sure. Yeah. So speaking of the future, um, and, and sort of like the, uh, uh, your work in public history, essentially, um, where do you see yourself as far as like, cause you got the book, the book is released now. Um, I mean, I'm sure this was, was at some level a goal of yours, uh, from, you know, for a while to, to publish something and, and, you know, have it be widely read, which, which it is, which is exciting, um, for, for, to be honest, exciting for you, but for exciting for all of us, because we've been, you know, sort of watching, watching you work for a while, and I'm happy that yeah. you get the, the, the recognition and, and the readership that you deserve. Um, where do you see like the Humanity Archive and stuff pushing forward? Like, where are some places you want to expand, or how did you see the growth um, in this kind of public history that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I um, that's a good question. I would like to do more books. Um, I, I do have some opportunities um, 
that I'm not, you know, knock on wood. I don't want to speak about things before they're sure, fully yeah, finalized, yeah. but uh, you know, there's interest in doing perhaps a series of humanity archive books of different overlooked histories. Um, you know, I've got uh, my community that I'm I'm starting to build out in terms of like mm-hmm. just housing on my own website, all these different courses that I've kind of been ramping up on. And um, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be adding a community aspect to that, where it's kind of like this village of people who can come and just talk about history and philosophy and all these things like off of social media in a more kind of intimate environment uh, where mm-hmm. there'll be a forum and live chats and different things like that. So I really want to build the humanity archive out itself. And then, uh, you know, just keep taking any, any other opportunities that I can to speak in public, ad- address the public and, um, you know, kind of bridge that divide between academic history and, and public interest. Right. Uh, Cause I think, you know, in the ivory tower, a lot of times, you know, there's some great books that come. I mean, but the average public isn't reading those, right? There's a lot of diversity in books too coming out of uh, the ivory tower of figures that are fascinating and that people need to know about. But a lot of times, those only circulate within, you know, those circles. So I'm trying to bridge that divide of like rigorous research, but also trying to figure out always how I can appeal to the public, whether it be through social media or podcasts or just whatever mediums that that are available, or you know, to uh, kind of flow back and forth to, to bridge that gap, to bring people the information that I feel like they need. That's great. I, I love that you want to go forth and spread it more. I mean, hopefully at some point, perhaps with museums, you could do some, you know, historic sites. I feel like you know, there's there's sort of endless possibilities for spreading yeah, this absolutely. type of history. It's sort of the more difficult history, but it's more positive in that it's how we all come together as humans. I think a lot, whenever I read your book, I get a lot of abstract questions. <laughs> and, mm. you know, I don't want to ask a bunch of abstract questions. Um, but I think it just makes me think, perhaps. And maybe there probably are not answers to a lot of the questions I have when I'm reading your work. That's good. That's, that's actually okay. not common with a lot of stuff. <laughs> that's uncommon, I think, with some history books. Because uh, yeah. some, some, some history books, is you know, they're spitting a lot of knowledge and information at you. But they're, they're not many that make me pause from a philosophical right. and intellectual perspective to think about, you know, what I'm reading in a meta perspective um, or how I'm, how I'm consuming this stuff and sort of like the, in the conglomerate of the, uh, of the whole. Um, but I'd love to actually give the, our listeners a little bit of take, like just plug the book a little bit more so we can get some more buyers. Yeah. You should definitely go buy it wherever you can buy, purchase books actually, but um, we'll plug it again at the end. But um, in the book specifically, uh, are there any, particular stories or things that you shared that surprised you anything that was you know that stuck with you personally while writing it or or or, 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 or putting it putting that piece together um that would be uh you know uh that were sort of like the the hook for for you when you're like okay this is this is going to be the sort of the center of this 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 piece or this part of this book well i think the setup would be uh you know just the amount of whitewashing that has been done of black history uh throughout decades and decades and uh you know for over a century you know um whether it be saying slavery was benign and you know these benevolent benevolent uh slave owners or whether it be um you know people who should have been in the narrative but were sidelined right or or you know saying these people were a footnote um when they weren't right or um you know for instance black inventions you know we kind of hear about that as kind of like this novelty but, uh, you know, I, I quote this statistic, uh, you know, there was like 50,000 uh, inventions produced by black people between I think it was 1870 and uh, 1920. I'm, I'm paraphrasing on that. But, you know, that was second only to English and German uh, immigrants. Right. So, you know, there's these contributions uh, that, that just really get into the fabric of the making of America and the world, for that matter, that have been excluded and uh, downplayed and, and you know, uh, whitewashed. And that goes outside of America as well. You know, people focus on Egypt, but uh, Kush, you know, had more pyramids than Egypt. They weren't as large as Egypt, but, you know, they had this whole Mm -hmm. civilization that's kind of, so again, it's about showing the whitewashing, which, you know, have a chapter on that that kind of goes through that. And then the rest of the book is kind of bringing the narratives back into the whole story of of humanity. So uh, I think the whitewashing is the one that sets it up and that's the most shocking to see just the ways in which, uh, and the effort that was put into uh, the whitewashing of Black history over the over the years. 
Yeah, not to tie this back into that that Cleopatra documentary, but but you know, speaking of leaders that aren't Macedonian uh, and, and conquerors, uh, Kush has some remarkable um, uh, queens and kings over the course of its existence that are definitely worth checking out. But under explored, yeah. that's what I said. Like people are arguing over uh, over Egypt, while you know, if you really wanted to tie into some uh, history of uh, you know. Uh, Black people or darker skinned people, you know, you can go it's there's right a whole there. other, you know, after <laughs> right there's yeah. a pretty big continent, right? Like there's yeah. a lot more to be, be discovered. So, you know, I try to bounce around and show that, you know, some different uh, areas and civilizations and, uh, you know, that the pe- people might not have heard about or, or focused on. Another thing that that sort of stuck with me is the thought that we are just inundated with violence these days. I mean, movies are insane. And the violence you can see in some movies that are on television or Netflix Mm. or just, you know, streaming is horrifying to me. I'm not a big, you know, explosions and gun stuff fan. Um, But, and, you know, video games and things like that. And, you know, I'm not saying, oh, they're bad. But we, we are so inundated with violence in America today. And yet we totally underplay the violence of slavery. Um, Mm. And I think you said it was in a podcast, I think, or maybe it was in your book. It's I'm sorry, it all blends together. Um, You were talking about the weight of the word slavery and what it is. When you think about it, I mean, it should weigh you down. It should be something that you pause and you really like have almost a physical reaction to. But we seem to have lost that. And you know, have we lost sort of our shared humanness? Why are we afraid to talk about that violence when, you know, we are a country just inundated with violence? Yeah, I think that the capacity is there, um, you know, because you see with uh, the gun violence, you know, uh, there was a mass shooting that just happened here in Louisville a few days right. ago. Um, you know, and the conversations are, are had, um, you know, the empathy is displayed. Um but I think that it, it's who the empathy is applied to a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I don't think that empathy is always applied to black people. I don't think it's always applied to uh, enslavement in America. Um, so it's selective empathy, I think, you know, because even I think about and talked about the Great Depression. Right. We learned about that in every school. We empathize with people who uh, stood in the soup lines. And, you know, most of the pictures were white in my book. I think all of them are white people as though nobody else went through the Great Depression. Uh you know, uh, black people, Japanese people uh, in the mm-hmm. Great Depression era, you know, there's a lot of other cultures who were in America already, you know, uh, that were non-white who could be pictured as well. But, you know, uh, so I think, again, it's that selective empathy. But I do think we have the capacity for it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that we need to apply that <clears throat> to all people. And that's just not what happens, uh, you know, at all, honestly. So, uh, you know, it's it's a sad reality. Um, but, you know, I'm hoping I can bring a little bit more of that, you know, with the book and make people realize that. And hopefully to bring out that capacity. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because no matter how far back, it, like, the more you study history, even no matter how far back you go, if you really get into it, you're looking at, you know, a sibling, you're reading about a parent or a child or, a, you know, just a person. Like, this is just a person. That, that, you're, that, that you're really connecting or you're reading about doing whatever exploit they decided to write about in, in, in whatever book you're reading. Um, and it, it, it's strange how you think of, you know, all the progress that has changed over the world, especially in the last like, you know, 150 years and how different our lives are today versus they were, you know, th- two or 3000 years ago. But uh, even when you go far that far back, sometimes I'm like, oh, wow, these people are exactly the same <laughs> As, as us yeah. in, in a lot Other of ways. Than some cell phones and some technology yeah. that we have, right? TV screens. I mean, there's yeah. uh, so much has changed, but so much has stayed the same. Uh, absolutely. So in our first episode of Too Complicated for History, we talked about the creation of an American identity and what does it mean to be an American? And we try to ask a lot of different people that, we, you know, historians, and we say, what, what is an American to you? Define an American. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, today, if somebody says, you know, I am an American, what does that mean to you? What is an American? I mean, the, my definition is going to going to be different than I think the reality is for for a lot of people. I mean, to me, America is a, is a, a place. Um, you know, where, where there's not 
there's nowhere else in the world with so much like diversity of groups here that have come here and made lives here. Um, and I think there could be this kind of a beautiful kind of pluralism where everybody could kind of be themselves together and, you know, not have to um, totally just lose their identity to this American identity. There's always that interplay of like, you know, uh, you know, can I be black and be American? Can I be Pakistani and be American? Can I be, uh, you know, uh, you know, just to, to reconcile these identities, because ultimately, you know, throughout history, America has meant white. And I, and it was Toni Morrison who said that America has meant white and everybody else has to hyphenate. Right. Um, mm. So it's always the, the trying to push back against that, knowing that, you know, your group has even been here for generations or made major contributions to America. But still that overlying reality um, that America has meant white, uh, you know, for for its history. Uh, and it's not said now, but I think that's why a lot of people are still internally uh, who, who aren't white. You know, sometimes people even see the American flag as like, you know, a white thing. Right. And when it's really shouldn't represent that. Um, so American to me, the ideal of what it could be versus what I think it still is. You know, that's kind of where I, I go with that question. And, um, you know, again, just trying to bring a perspective where I'm hoping, you know, to, to broaden minds to, to what, you know, America could be versus what I think that it still is and how it views itself a lot of times. I think that's a great answer because I think one of my favorite answers that that someone gave was that to be an American is to be constantly seeking improvement or betterment, um, which is exactly, you know, how you're speaking. It's that, you know, we can do better and we're constantly seeking to do better. Um, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I like that as yeah. well. So I really, I really liked your answer. It's not an easy question. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a great way to end. Maybe a thought provoking one to, to leave with. <laughs> so um, for all of our listeners, um, Jermaine, where can they, they, they find your book and, 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 and any, all the rest of the places that the Humanity Archive lives? Absolutely. Uh, so I've been working on just getting everything on my website, uh, www.thehumanityarchive.com uh, for the book's Specifically, just uh, it's the humanityarchive.com backslash books. Uh, but there you'll find uh, links to my podcast. You'll find links to the community and courses. You'll find link to the book. Uh, so just yeah, go to the humanityarchive.com and you'll find everything uh, that you need there to connect with me. Yeah, it's a New York Times bestseller. You should be able to find it. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Instagram, <laughs> the Humanity Archive. That's where right. I'm most active uh, over there. Um, and that's, that's my at. Uh, wherever else uh, there there is as well, I do a little bit on TikTok and Twitter, and uh, oh great, you know, good Facebook too. So uh, yeah, just the Humanity Archive. So uh, please join me, and uh, you know, and I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank for being you here. so much for being here. I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the full episode of Too Complicated for History. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, please leave us a review on Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to follow us on our social media platforms at 2C4H underscore podcast or check out the link in the description. This will keep you in the loop for show updates, new episodes, and exclusive content. Too Complicated for History is a podcast from Primary Source Media, produced by Patrick Long and Lynn Price Robbins, edited and mixed by Curtis Fritch, opening theme music by Sheena Biratella.